Hello, everyone. Good evening. I would like to welcome you all at this third session of the GLASS virus seminar series. Uh, for those who do not know, the GLASS virus is an international platform for the development of new educational strategies and new perspectives in GLASS art. And this uh, third seminar, Writing as a Way of Making, does fit very well within this global mission. More and more, writing has become an important part of artistic expression, so it makes sense to think about the possible relations between making and writing. So writing as a way of making, making as a way of writing, or even other combinations that I cannot think of at this particular moment. Uh, luckily, I'm not alone this evening for thinking about these matters, so uh, we are happy that we could invite some of the finest artists in the world that already did some thinking with regard to making and writing. The nice thing about our guests today is that uh, it, they did not just think about it, they thought about it by doing it. So in a way, their artistic practice exemplifies the topic at hand very well. That is, of course, the reason that we invited them. So let me first give a short intro for each of these artists. Madeli Villun is a former student uh, at PXL Med School of Arts in Hasselt in Belgium. She is born in Pretoria, South Africa, and in her jewelry, she expresses a nostalgia towards South Africa's diminishing natural wildlife. Ella Oppenheimer, she is a former student at Bezalel Academy of Art and Design in Jerusalem, Israel. She uses glass as the prime source of material and she is inspired by different social and familial, familial circles of life. And then the last artist is Maria Barnas. Maria is a Dutch visual artist and a poet, a writer, Born in the Netherlands, she is advisor at the Rijksacademie in Amsterdam and teaches at the Zandberg Institute also in Amsterdam, where she is head of the master program Approaching Language. Me, uh, I'm Bert Willems, head of research at PXL Med School of Arts in Hasselt in Belgium. Uh, as head of research, I'm also coordinating the PhD program at the Faculty of Architecture and Arts at the University of Hasselt. So for the PhDs in the arts that are enrolled within our PhD program, we are always exploring how writing can be part of these PhDs without having to conform the way that writing is embedded in the other more scientific PhDs at our university. And that is why I'm very excited about this session, exploring the ways writing and making can be combined in one and the same artistic expression. And of course, the discussion should not be limited to the four of us. So dear audience, when there are questions that pop up in your minds while listening to all of these examples, please put them in the question and answer panel at the bottom. Uh, small comments can be made in between the discussion and the chat box, but leave the structural more elaborate questions for the end uh, in the question and answer session uh, and put them in the in the panel of the question and answers. Yeah, and of course, uh, please mute yourself in order to avoid the background noise. And uh, as a last thing to be mentioned, uh, Santa Claus uh, came by and as, a present, and as a present for all of us, uh, he made available the recordings of the previous session on our YouTube channel. Uh, and it's also going to be available and, uh, at the Glass Virus website. Uh, so let us move on. Uh, first, uh, the artists going to present themselves uh, for five minutes. Uh, I'm afraid that we really have to keep an eye on the timing of these presentations because we want to focus uh, on the panel discussions afterwards. So I apologize, uh, ap apologize beforehand uh, for my interruptions there. So uh, maybe I can ask Madeli, would you like to present first? Uh, maybe you can share your screen with all of us. Thanks, Bert, uh, and welcome to everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thanks for the intro. Yes, I'm from South Africa. Um, uh, studied BTEC and jewelry design and manufacturing in, in Tswane University of Technology, my hometown, Pretoria. 
uh, they were really focused on technical skills and also really academic um, structural classical writing um, writing articles and um, a thesis as well um, thereafter I did some I worked independently as a jewelry designer and goldsmith um, also working at the Beers Diamond Company in, in Milan um, but I did want to pursue a postgraduate degree in, in the arts. Um, that's why I'm, I did my, um, I recently graduated the summer in, um, at BXL, MAD in Hasselt, as Bert just said. Um, and I'm also at the moment enrolled for another uh, master in visual arts in the sculpture and in installation program, uh, mostly in the glass studio. Um, so as this um, seminar is discussing the topic of writing in art, I will uh, quickly read to you some extracts of my exact words, uh, which I've written down um, in my thesis article. Um, and all the pictures are from the work I physically made, um, or I took pictures and um, added writing to them, which I will explain now. Um, so my research mainly focused on the symbolic metamorphosis of collected animal bones and remnants of skin. Um, I transformed them through biomorphic abstraction into abject specimens, which I then contextualized in a contemporary cabinet of curiosities titled Cuters and Osseum, Skin and Bones. I aim to transform these organic remnants combining glass and metal into new mutated forms, some wearable as contemporary jewelry pieces. My art voices my nostalgia for my home country, South Africa, um, its diminishing natural wildlife, and my fragmented memories of, of observing these um, wildlife as a child in the rural landscape. I have an impulse to preserve the delicate details and sense of wonder I encountered upon finding these attractive remnants in nature, portraying them as cherished artifacts. Their fragility and impermanence are conveyed by visualizing fictionally distorted specimens through a fusion of the natural fragments with fluid biomorphic forms in glass. Accordingly, this process forms a strong symbiosis between the artificial and the natural, representing the human interference with nature when I transform found objects into artifacts. Typically of me, as new ideas evolve, I not only take photos, but I also record my research and writing in a personal Instagram page. Here um, follows a few screenshots of the posts I made uh, where I wrote down quotes um, and keywords uh, that um, resonate with my emotions um, of the specific art pieces I'm making. Um, I will expand later in the discussion um, uh, on these pages and why they were the inspiration behind my catalog, which I also made as part um, of my research output at PXL. I've written a, a thesis article and as an appendix to this p um, thesis, I made this um, digital as well as a printed catalog, um, which shows photographic art plates uh, with descriptions of the curiosities, which I physically made um, form part of my contemporary cabinet. I quickly play um, a clip to show this catalog. Um, so this is basically the artistic writing to which I will be referring in our discussion, uh, which we'll be having tonight, and, and deliberating why I consider this writing as an independent art, um, as well as a tool for my making. Um, this catalog is in the style of a thesaurus um, from the, the, the natural sciences, such as 
um, Ernest Haeckel and Alberta Siva. I don't know if you maybe noticed that. Um, and then yes, to, to create my own cabinet of curiosities involved a few steps, which I explained in detail in my thesis as well. Um, my cabinet consisted of four categories as was the convention in, in the wonder rooms of the past. And there's a, com a cabinet com compromising of artificialia, naturalia, exotica and scientifica. This is an example of a page of, of my catalog. Uh, at the bottom, you would see the writing. Um, it allowed me to write and explain about the different sections of my curiosity cab cabinet, where I wrote the captions in a fictional language, um, enabling, basically yeah, enabling me to contextualize my work. Um, this is a, a section artificialia, where I decided to, to place the jewelry pieces that I made. Um, another section, naturalia, which I decided would be the, the section for the uh, organic found objects. And um, the exotica, which contains the actual sculptures I made um, in glass. Um, and lastly, the scientifica section of my cabinet showcases the raw materials and tools I used within my process of making. Um, these are the molds of the replicas. I also find them to be art and um, by using words and this catalog, it allowed me to justify basically an artistic display uh, of the beautiful in-between processes of making. And yeah, that's just a quick okay. overview. Over to, to you guys. Thank you uh, very much, Madali. Uh, we'll come back to, uh, to those things uh, later on. Uh, maybe Thanks. we can give the floor to Ella. Hi. Uh, yeah. So I'm happy to, he to be here and hi to everyone. Uh, so my name is Ella and I live in Jerusalem and I just graduated from the Israeli Academy of Art and Design. And I think I would like to share a bit about my final project because this is the biggest uh, project that I had until now. Um, so the name of the project is Hamakomi and Chem. It's a phrase that we use to uh, say to someone that lost someone that they love. Um, a comfort uh, uh, um, phrase. Um, okay, so I start my final project uh, searching around space and places that I will feel comfortable in. And um, a couple of months before I started my final project, my grandmother passed away and I started looking around her home that get change um, after she passed away. It was very interesting to watch the differences that happened in the house. And after this like um, understanding, I, I start um, looking around the animal world in the nature. And I start searching around nests all over and I love the way that birds build their nests because it's very intuitive. And also today you, you, we can see in nests also pieces of metal and pieces of like um, plastic. So it's very interesting to see that birds using whatever they can find. They don't just looking for leaves anymore. Um, and every bird have her own kind of um, nest. It's very, they have very, it's amazing uh, word and you can find amazing nests in Israel. Um, so I start um, making nests from glass, I work with in the flame, um, with the flame, and I thought it would be very big, you know, glass blowing, uh, in uh, and to blow glass, and then the coronavirus starts, and I want to work small and alone, so it was good for me. Um, I check the way that the nest connecting to the tree. It was very interesting. There are very different ways. They work very big and then very small, and they use color and sniff out and clear. And in the beginning, it was very important for me to do it very in a very uh, figurative way, to do it very like similar to the true thing. And after a while, I just start working with colors and shapes when I feel comfortable with the material. Um, 
after a while start uh, collecting objects from my grandmother's house and built nests to each object. It was very interesting to, to combine glass with other materials. Um, so you can see some example. So this is a weight that my grandmother brings with her to, from South Africa when she moved to Israel. So yeah, it's interesting to see. Um, they used to um, weight their babies before and after feeding. So I use this one as well. During the whole time, I filmed the drives from home from my parents' house to Betzalel. I live uh, around the Green Line in the settlement. Um, so we need to pass a checkpoint every time we're going to Jerusalem. And Near us, we have a whole wall of the drive. And after I have those videos, I understand that the car is also a space that I stay in for a long time every day. It's also very like important space for me. Um, so it was also part of my project. And when the corona starts, we had like a lockdown and everyone moved back home. So I stayed with my family for um, a couple of months. So um, I'm coming from a religious family, so we're not using electricity on Saturday. So I put a camera for the whole Saturday and then I took a video of the whole environment at home. And then I put all, uh, like the first 30 minutes of Saturday also in the project. So you can see like, into my home, the whole family situation. So you can see my brother dancing around and it was interesting to see it from a different eye, from a new eye. And during the whole time, I wrote to myself a lot of so short stories about stuff that just happened during the whole process and thought and some, some interesting things that I have in my head. And I didn't know it will be part of the final uh, project. Like I thought it would be just on the side, and in then it was a very big part of the project as well. And then this is it. So in the end, I just uh, took some branches from my parents' garden and from Jerusalem and from the way. And they built nests from glass around them. Um, so. It was, it's, we had an exposition, even if it was in the corona, so it was small, not a lot of people could come, but it was, it happened. So you can see me talking with people, like everyone covered with the masks. And yeah, so you can just see some pictures of the project. I love the way that the glass connected to the, to other materials, so it was very interesting to see how it burned the trees during the process. And if uh, you have some questions after, so I would really love to answer. And this is it. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Very nice indeed. Uh, maybe we can give the floor to Maria. Hi, Maria. Uh, Hello, everyone. Um, good evening. It's really enjoyable, I have to say, also to see the, the works of Ella and Madeli. Um, I'm going to do a very short presentation um, and give you an example of my work. Um, but just to say a few general things on what I do is, um, so I write every day. I think I need writing to um, keep my thoughts somewhat uh, coherent. Um, I don't know how I developed this, but in writing, my thoughts are more clear to me than without the words in front of me. So I think uh, by now I really need to write every day. Um, I work with language. I think that is the basis. And uh, this work can take several forms. It can be a poem an essay, a short film, or an installation. Um, I think this is because I, I like to use language as a tool for expressing ideas, but also uh, look at language as a, something that is or can be solid, um, like language as solid matter. Um, 
this is not only a metaphor, but sometimes it is also just a metaphor. I think a lot of uh, ways in which we use language um, may be instrumental, but um, in recent years, I've become more and more aware of the fact that language is also um, has also its own inherent structures and mechanisms that rule our thinking and are um, very um, uh, decisive in the ways we think and we organize our social and political structures. So language is not as innocent as uh, we might like to think. Um, as an example of my work, um, I'm going to show you um, an image. This image is um, something that I found in, uh, in Germany in a photography museum uh, where they were presenting the very first uh, photographic experiments. And to my surprise, there was this beautiful color flare in the image, um, which later on when I um, asked for to see the, um, um, the original image, um, I will just describe it. Uh, so you, uh, maybe it's good that you now have the phantom in your head of the image that you yeah. So maybe that's better. <laughs> maybe it's better because, in fact, I do want to speak about the difference in uh, having seen something and having having written about it. Um, so the image you saw was through the reflection of a glass vitrine in, in which it was presented, and through having been presented for years and years, this was why it was um, uh, disfigured or discolored, and the color flare that you saw was in fact. Uh, a distortion of the original image. When I asked for the original image uh, from the archive, they gave me a portrait of two people. And um, I wrote a poem about them. And then I leave it up to you. And maybe we can discuss later what is the space between these two uh, forms in which uh, I present you this image. Mm -hmm. A couple in grey tones with star specked faces stare into a space that cannot quite be defined. They know their image will be captured and soaked in light, and perhaps as river water eases the bark from fallen branches, their likenesses will float elsewhere. This space is gray and rimmed with a gradient of colors, a light with possibility. The man frowns. He cannot take the capturing of image seriously, although the process has been explained to him many times. This could explain why his hair shows an unruly curl on the right side of his head. The woman's face is wide and her mouth is a short straight line. Pale eyes with shadows underneath. Her straight hair is parted in the middle. Bunched up on either side of her head, it broadens her lifeless cheeks. It is hard to tell whose hand rests in the middle. The flat square dress of the woman, edged with a pressed white frill, encompassing a thick neck extends into a neat square shape of the man's dark suit. They share this hand, which looks like it could be writing a message. The white woman sees, seems brighter now. What do they see? They blur into a question about what exactly is visible. Given that background and details in varying contrast and saturation can be changed at will and sharpened at the edges. So I'll leave it at that uh, for now. Okay, very nice. Uh, thank you for presenting uh, in these five minutes. It's uh, quite short, but uh, I think we can uh, we can have a nice discussion about the way writing uh, and making are yeah how they are combined. Uh, Maria, in your work, it's quite uh, apparent. But uh, maybe I can ask. Uh, Madeli or Ella, how is writing uh, being a part of making in your work? Maybe you can explain it. Well, for, for me, um, I think the, the writing really uh, helps to put my artistic practice into a context. Um, and that's something that's really important to me. I want part of my research is to have my um, the pieces that I make to be put in the context of a contemporary cabinet of curiosities. And I think without the writing, without that catalog that I created with the, the fictional Latin 
type of um, descriptions and this, this style and the font of the writing, I think it wouldn't have exactly been in that, that context. Um, mm -hmm. I think the writing is quite crucial to my, to my artistic practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So was it for creating a kind of atmosphere that you, that the context it, and yeah. That it's it creates an atmosphere and a context. Um, yeah. And I think it also uh, as an added bonus, it, it, it kind of helps me to, to justify this, like um, the, the, the way that I can present these, like this hidden processes, like in the making while making and a piece of art like those processes that, that no one sees only I see that making a mold sometimes that's so beautiful to me now I can t take a picture and document it and uh, with my writing I can put it into a category um, mm -hmm. into the scientific category and that I think makes it a piece of art um, mm -hmm. so yeah <laughs> yeah Ella, when I look at your work, uh, I had the impression that you you use the writing in another way. Maybe you can also say how this is how the writing is related to your work. How is the the interaction between the two? So I think um, for me the writing was before and near the work, and in, just in the end it's become to be a part. And I'm just using writing as a way of thinking. I think I'm just, I need to write to myself what happened to like be able to, to, to work with those uh, situations. So it's, I think it's, it's, it's before I even start um, doing the glass or the art work. And I also think that like when you put them together, so the stories or the worlds bring a whole the, another story to the to the art, so you can just look at the art, and when you read the stories, so it's bring another um, level or mm. yeah. So I think uh, in in the process, the the writing is is a kind of inspiration to the to the artwork. Is that correct? Yeah, I think I think it's it. I needed to write to myself just because I needed to. I don't know how to why to like I don't have a good explain about it. Mm. And and then it gives it inspire inspired me, but it also it helped me to understand what's important for me in this situation. Mm. Like I had situation around me and after I wrote about them. So it helped me to understand what what was the interesting thing that happened that I want to work with. So mm. it helped me organize yeah. my thing. Yeah. Maria, yeah. Yeah, can I ask you something about that, Ella? Because I, I'm a bit uh, interested to sometimes how when you start writing, it seems to lead you along a path that you might not have expected before. And I'm not sure how this works and why that is, but I think it's because um, your thoughts are taken along in a different way through maybe more language-based associations when you start writing. So it might lead you to a different, um, through a different path than if you were working just with images or with a glass. And I wonder, did you ever um, notice that you thought, maybe this is a piece of fiction and actually it's not true what I'm writing about myself and about all these things? Um, yeah, so it's interesting. Um, I think um, it's 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 always take me to another place that I thought like it's always take me, and I think that um, I think I think sometimes I I write stuff and then it's too personal, so I'm like I don't know if I want to share it or not. And then when you just look at the image or the glass, so everyone can understand whatever they want. But when you put words, so it's very clear what you want to say. And yeah. I'm not sure that's true, but <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's when good. I, I, I should think about it. It's interesting that I don't know I don't know too, because it's when you put words so it's become to be very clear, but sometimes it's not. Yeah. It depends, of course, how you write, but I think even in the clearest descriptions, um, it might be possible for people to uh, read something different in it. But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I was more like maybe uh, 
so yeah maybe it doesn't it doesn't uh, go for you because you use text as a way to describe things then or um but maybe for Madhuri, have you noticed sometimes that that uh, writing leads you somewhere where you d maybe don't want to be at all like that it uh, distracts you more than that it's just helpful and is that also can that also be part of your practice i think uh for me the writing really I think writing was cru crucial for me, like at the start, okay, let's start at the beginning. Um, we had, as part of the, the master's program, obviously um, it's expected of you to write a, a thesis um, communicating your results of your artist practice. Um, You're yeah, basically showing your research in words. Uh, so I started with that. Um, I was really, um, yeah, used to used to that with the previous university where I studied it was really like separate writing an article um, and then your work of art is something different, um, your practical pieces. Um, so at PXL, um, I did start with that, um, doing research, um, reading up and then just writing it down in a really formal way. Um, but then uh, getting feedback from my supervisor, you, I noticed that BXL, um, they were really quite liberating, um, telling us that we can kind of think out of the box. Um, we don't have to be, I mean, you have to be academic, but you, they encourage like freedom of thought and freedom of a way of writing. Um, so that got me thinking and my writing kind of developed into more of a, a yeah, a documentation, uh, let's say um, I read up on some interesting categories and I saw that perhaps a catalog is something that could um, describe my work better, um, show my research better than an actual, thick 80 pieces, pages um, of writing. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> Maybe uh, I, uh, well, I think, uh, Madeline, that it's nice to describe this like this. Uh, I have a question for Ella, uh, because you were uh, using your writing quite in the beginning of the process, but did it also end up in the results and how did it end up in the results? That is also something I would like to know. Um, so I just had a book next to the works that mm. if people have time and they would like to, so they could read. Um, but it's super interesting what Madeli said because I think I feel the same with the academic writing that you should have our writing process near your project. And I think in the minute that I leave the, um, the academic way of writing my research, it's become to be more personal and more interesting. And then it was much easier for me to work with. Because in the beginning, I tried to be very like academic and write like the right stuff and put the right names in, in my project. And then when I leave it, I just wrote whatever I thought about it stories and stuff that wasn't so like they, they wasn't connect to the glass work it was just about about mm -hmm. me about my life during the coronavirus time and just in general mm -hmm. um so i think it, it was interesting because in the academic a lot of times we're just trying to do the right thing and then we do, when you just do whatever it's right for you in the writing it's become to be much more interesting and also much more connecting to your research and not just to the academic research mm -hmm. the writing so. yeah Ella, I, have, I have something to add um i also feel that like without that that first encouragement from the university for me to write i i don't know if i would have done it and i don't know if i would have come upon the like the research i read about alberto siba and uh, Heckel the books. I don't know if I would have come to that um, to that point where I saw that I could I could make a catalog and that would really help me in my artistic work. So I I do think like yeah um, 
that first initial thinking of really writing academically is kind of an inspiration mm. to get to where you need to be in your writing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's that's something I think I, I did need that to start with. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. When I when I look uh, at the two of you, there's a uh, with the, the two uh, uh, there's a clear connection between writing uh, and and uh, and the artistic work. Maria, uh, when I look at your work, I have the impression that you also regard your writing as 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 the creation itself. So maybe you also because we yeah you can see the 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 writing as an inspiration or you can see it as an explanation of what happened but i have the impression that there's a more intricate relation between the two in your work is that correct that's that's hard for me to judge of course uh, not being overly familiar with the other two so practice yeah. but but uh, maybe what you are uh, pointing to is that I also write uh, pieces that are autonomous mm. literature, if that's what you uh, mean. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I found it quite um, a struggle uh, in my in my practice, um, if, especially in the beginning when I started out. Um, I had the feeling that I had to speak almost. Uh, two uh, different languages working in the in the visual arts and and in the field of literature and um, the way I talked about my work with for example an editor uh, making a book of poems was very different mm. than I was talking to um, a museum curator and um, even though in my mind it was all the same <laughs> and it's all like connected and um, uh, it helps each other exist and it it informs each other and um i think only yeah i don't know maybe i was i'm not sure if, if it was me being too um understanding to these different fields if mm. I, if i could have pushed it earlier if maybe not by now i've reached the point where i don't care so much um how things are perceived that i can push also a bit more the the different um areas into each other mm. is to quite this could could yeah this took quite some time uh, yeah. yeah and by now i feel that it's it's uh, indeed more in the outside world also how i perceive it on the inside that's that uh, language and and image and and also the way you you still this divide um in in how you talked about it just now the academic and the and the more creative way of writing i i don't want to see um uh, a split in that i think mm -hmm. it, i think academic writing can be extremely creative creative writing can be extremely academic. If you look at the, the poems of, of Anne Sexton, they are, um, they are creative, but also intellectual wrought masterpieces. That, mm. um, and I think it's just a bit of a, I think our world is, is lagging a bit behind in what's actually being done and being made by it. also how you, what you show um, Madadi and, and Ella, that mm. it's in a way not interesting to keep these divides. It's just, yeah, we are. We still have a university and the art school. Maybe that also doesn't help. I, I'm mm -hmm. not sure, but I have the feeling that the way we 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 structure our our art education and education in general does not necessarily fit to what people are making and and thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I also find it. Um, I I made a personal Instagram page, and this was something I didn't I didn't share with lecturers. Um, as as such, um, where where I posted pictures of my in between things sketches, um, just some things I edited, and I I with the platform of Instagram, there's always a bit where you can write and a bit where you post your picture, and I um, for me it was always using other people's words, uh, poetry quotes, words that resonated with me, um, not my own words. I'm not a poet, um, and those kind of really linked to my to to my work for me in that moment to my emotion in that moment perhaps while making that sketch or um working with that certain kind of material and um afterwards that uh i took screenshots it's it's i had a additional subject um as part of my master program 
just a subject where we shared images and talked about about the um, progress um, manufacturing steps of the the practical work and um, so I took screenshots with these words and I think that's where actually my idea of a frame where there's a picture with a little bit of writing underneath that's where it all started the idea that came up and then I was starting to think about fonts and styles what would that mean together with Instagram you have these hashtags it's really mm -hmm. a particular style and um, those few words can mean a lot and add a lot to the picture um, or the quote also makes it I think more accessible to a lot of people people who are not triggered by the the picture but triggered by the words um, by the writing um, so I think it yeah it, it then appeals to like a, a bigger audience but what I was wanted to say was it's this informal writing that triggered quite a more academic writing um, mm. in my work I think yeah I can imagine yeah now, uh, in, in history, we, we have quite a huge uh, histor historical record of writings by, by art critics. Uh, now we see something like the artists uh, writing themselves. Uh, and uh, is, does this have advantages? Or, or, yeah, in research of the arts, it's becoming more and more uh, apparent that, uh, that artists also uh, do some writing. Uh, how can you comment about it? Is this a good thing? Uh, what is the relation to an, another person writing about your work, or you talking about your work? What is the difference, or is it the same thing? And how do they, these two things relate to each other? This. Well, if I can, <laughs> yeah, I can. Course. Well, uh, for me, it's. I'm. I'm really glad that we actually are starting to get this space where we can write about our own work. Um, my work, I really like, I would really like it to be interpreted in a certain kind of way, in a certain kind of context. Um, whereas when you get an art critic, then I don't think they could possibly know every intricate um, thought process or um, reason behind your thinking and behind uh, your reason for choosing a certain material or style or uh, idea um, so for me being my own critic I mean I'm really critical as well <laughs> about my own things um, but it's for me that opportunity to basically write and tell people in what kind of way they should look at my work and also um, a way for them to see all the detail and all the like the like the small little things that would get unnoticed um just to make make the audience aware of it um for for my work i think that's important i don't want want it to get lost um so if i have that platform instagram is a start i i use that a lot um and obviously before i make a post i'm really critical i'm really thinking why am i is is this is this good enough to put out there for me, not just for the audience, I, I, I make the work for mm. yeah. to express myself. Um, so that's already a way to critique myself. Um, yeah. yeah. Is it the same with you, Ella? Uh, how do you look upon this? Um, well, I think I love reading uh, people writing about their art. Yeah. I love knowing all the small little what you just said, like why they choose that and what what it's like why in this way so i love right uh, reading people writing about the art but i think it's also super interesting to hear other people or to read other people when they like looking at your uh, work and they and write whatever they feel about it because i think in the minute that you put your work out there so it's, it's not your work anymore it's like mm -hmm. something in between so it, for me, it was very interesting to see people um, giving me like their ideas about my uh, project. Mm -hmm. But of course, that I love writing. Um, I think I'm not writing about what you can see. I'm writing more about the process and like my thought about it. And I think it's also uh, connected what you asked before about how I 
put it in the end because I could put it much more um, bigger, like, okay, everyone needs to read those stories with those works, mm -hmm. but I feel that I want the works to speak alone. So if someone mm -hmm. wants to read the whole history, so I had a whole book in, in the room, but I want to have those separate areas that mm -hmm. someone can go in and just walk and see. And if someone is more interested, so they can read as well. But I, I also feel like that, that I love explain all the details, but sometimes I'm like taking a step back and I like give people also to to. Yeah, yeah I their... can imagine that uh, at sometimes the having an insight into the the, the views of of the artist that it can have a negative impact as well. That uh, that you sometimes do not want to know all of this maybe yeah so yeah, that's true. Mentioned that it's not always uh, good to have an insight in, in in these details in the heads of the artists yeah. okay maybe i can uh, put here a question of the audience so uh, i think we uh, have here some questions so uh, if there are other questions, uh, please put them in the question and answer panel. Uh, first, we have a, a question uh, by Paul McAllister, uh, and I think it's pointed towards uh, Maria. Maria uh, Maria's comments about writing a fiction. Is it that making and writing, writing are negotiations, ways of thinking? Everything is mediated, isn't it? And I think it is, uh, yeah, it, it's pointed at Maria. Maybe you can answer this. Can you see the question as well? No, I can't. Um, I'll, I'll repeat it. Hi, Maria's comment about writing a fiction. Is it that making and writing are negotiations, ways of thinking? Everything is mediated, isn't it? Um everything is mediated what do you understand under that as a question everything is mediated um what i maybe i can just say what i thought i was meaning <laughs> that I'm, i sometimes it can yeah it can go to, uh different ways but i have the feeling that for example if i write about a certain artwork or if i write an essay or a fiction but maybe it's clearer what i mean when i'm writing an essay when i'm trying to describe something that, or sh want to share something that I've seen, then I have, I have the feeling that depending on, for example, what time of the day I start writing this, or depending on my mood, or depending on what I have just read before, I will write a different um, essay about this work. So I'm very much aware of the, the temporariness of uh, things that, uh, that divert my thoughts and my writing in a certain direction therefore i know i i cannot write a truth or the truth mm -hmm. about anything i think this is also very exciting but it can also be frustrating because i think at the at the basis of my writing is is a need or a longing to, to share something <laughs> so it's a very it's a it's a paradox um yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, understand. I think that's interesting that um i also use kind of fictional writing um if you look at my um those those pages in the catalog that i made um if if you don't know about these things you can look at it um i can share a screen uh i want to show you an example this is a, a page in my um this is the object um at the top yeah the name of the the of my collection and the whole look i try to make it look like this thesaurus and the words there if you wouldn't know latin of course you would think it's um it is a proper name for uh, for a specimen mm -hmm. and i made it into a cl a, a class of animal uh, or a, yeah, a mutated kind of animal and then I wrote a description there, there just in a, in a font. Um, but I'm kind of made up my own type of Latin. Um, 
not all the words are really Latin. Some I fused together, some I just took pieces of it um, to, to, to make a word. Um, I, I took uh, words that I associated with these just by looking at it. So with this one, uh, it was a funny um, thing in the class. Every, this was one of my first pieces that I made before the lockdown. The only actual piece I made before the lockdown. And excuse my crude language, but my fellow classmates said this. We had to give a name. We had to post one one piece with a name with a title, uh, and I wasn't sure what to name it. And everyone said this is Buttbird, and obviously it was a bit Buttbird. Uh, <laughs> it was a bit crude for me, and and I wanted to to put it in this context um, of a, an official name, and so I made up this language, Promerops glutealis and when you look the separate words um these are just fancy words for bus bird um yeah. but fused together um so this is quite yeah a, a fantasy language yeah fiction. Uh, that i made yeah fiction yeah. language can i comment I don't know. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry i don't want to interrupt you madeline yeah. no 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 you're not i i think the it's very interesting that you use this uh, made up latin because mm -hmm. the I think it's almost a, a political standpoint you make there because like of course for a long time the world could only be categorized in new categories or let's say uh, the, the categories that were discovered by the uh, people who spoke Latin um, yes. even maybe a lot of these categories were already very familiar in indigenous cultures and whatever so this kind exactly. of filter of having to be able to speak Latin in order for it to, to reach the books and the official records is of course a, a terrible uh, misleading uh, and, and, and limited um, filter of, of uh, cultures. And, and actually only very recently uh, it was changed into English, which you could still say is, is a new uh, filter and not, I mean, does everyone need to be able to speak English? I think this is a very nice and interesting example of how, how language itself is also material and keeping things in place and mm. um, the, the way that people use it, maybe um, thinking, oh, that's the most uh, handy thing, mm -hmm. not thinking about what that means for other people for who it is not handy at all because they might not yes. even ever have learned this language. It's, um, and, and therefore, I think that you making it up is a very uh, cool thing to do because you show that you don't care about the, the official language of this, uh, yeah. Hmm. Maybe yeah, I can, so. uh, can have another question here from Andrew. Uh, from memory, the French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty wrote that a writer, like the weaver, works on the wrong side of their material. They have to do with words and only they do and only then they do find themselves surrounded by meaning. Does this idea speak to your practice of writing? And does it also speak to your glass practice? It's, it's very familiar to me, this thought. And yeah. I have to say, I've also read a lot about the, and the, here comes the word I find very hard to pronounce, phenomenology. Yeah. There, there yeah. I go. Um, uh, yeah, of course, like the writer, um, tries to um, mimic or react or create a reality, but it mm. is done in words. And, and these words themselves like starts to weave themselves around you and they are their own world. And it can be very disappointing. It can at times mm. be soothing. It can be, but it's, it's, it's never easy. Um, mm. uh, but the glass, I like the question, does this also speak to your glass practice? Which is a question for Ella and Madeline yeah. more than for me. I've, I've not done much with glass. <laughs> So yeah, if you look at words, they are carving things up and how does it relate to your experience of, of the things, yeah. Well, for me, I think uh, there's a lot of words relating spe specifically to glass. I think uh, fragility, mm. um, translucence. I think all of these words describe um, the way in which I handle my um, the making and yeah the presentation um, of my art pieces. Um, so obviously these words has come as an inspiration um, for me. I I think I use a lot of these 
these words in my Instagram post as keywords um, specifically, yeah, as inspiring for the pieces um, mm. and also inspiring the mood in which I make a piece. Yeah. Um, and do you yeah. have sometimes the impression that the words are carving up the experience in the wrong way? That it doesn't fit or... I think I really, I, I like to the play on words. Um, so for me, no, no, the words are never limiting. I think um, mm. I really like the play on the meaning of words. Um, yeah. Some words have dual meanings. Um, so I don't, I don't think the words are limiting. Um, I always, yeah, find a way to yeah, to describe my yeah, my to deal with it. Yeah. I think what the, what the question is trying to ask, um, Mali, but yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just projecting, of course. <laughs> but uh, is if you find sometimes that you, you go through this whole process, you make something in, in the glass, and there it is. And then the confrontation with what you have made might be a different one than what you set out to mm -hmm. do. Do you ever experience that? Or are you maybe very at one with everything you make and it's all good. <laughs> I, th I think my work really um, took its time to develop. Um, it was really strange. Um, so yeah, so I don't think, I, it, it took a really long time to get where it is at the end. Um, so I think it all really fits into place. Um, when the lockdown started in, in Belgium, all of us just started maybe making a first piece of work and not really uh, now in, in practice. Um, so not really knowing what we were doing for the rest of the year, um, where our artwork was going. And then, yeah, locked in the room, um, didn't have your facilities, your, your, uh, all your material with you. Um, and so the, the university encouraged us to first write our um, thesis, our um, academic writing article. And um, it was quite difficult to do that without seeing what you're writing about, your finished piece of artwork. Um, I really found that difficult. Mm -hmm. So I had to kind of find different ways to deal with that. Um, and I think that's where I went and I, I didn't work with glass. I, I, I don't have a glass studio in my room. So I had these little pieces of, I had a wax injector. So I had wax that I worked with to, to make shapes. And I had my found objects, my natural, my skulls and things like that. Um, so I was just basically working to put that together, took pictures of that and described that in words as, it, as if it were glass pieces as if it were finished pieces um, and that's where many of the photos are in, in my catalog they're not really existing pieces um, but they're documented as such um, and that's that's what I based my whole writing about pieces that didn't exist at that time and so I think when we got back to the studios in a few months then everything was built up and I could just start and work and yeah. Um, mm. uh, yeah. I can maybe yeah? Yeah. go back here yeah, to the question. So I think I also love playing with glass and also with bronze. And I think playing in, in, in my work is like a very important world. Because when I sit in the front of the, um, the fire or in the hot workshop, when I playing with the glass, so a lot of times it's going to another, a different direction. Like the glass also has her own um, mood. So sometimes she's doing whatever she wants. <laughs> We're talking about the glass as a person. And I think also with, when I'm writing, I, I, I have this feeling that I need to write and I want to, to put my thought into paper and I don't have, a whole um, idea about what I'm going to write. It's something just that's going out of me and then I'm like reading it and like, okay, what I write now, like why it was important, why I feel that it should be part or not um, in my process. 
and I think it's the same with glass because when when I'm, I'm start when I'm sitting in front, even the the final pieces that they put in in the um, exposition, I didn't I didn't know how they will look in the end. I just work. I just add glass, and then I want to put another color and another color, and maybe to take something back and to come back to it. Like so, it was. And I do the same process with stuff that I write. So I write something, and then I'm coming back after a couple of days, and I read it again, and I delete something, and then a couple of weeks I can read the same thing, and I, what I write it, and to delete the whole thing and try again. So I think it's the same with my art process, like. Yeah. Something in between playing and checking and yeah. something that the, like that. Yeah. That the same kind of dynamics are at work when writing and when, when making in glass, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have another question by Andrea. Can you comment about the experience of writing in a language that is not your own language? So not in your mother tongue. Mm. And what does it add? to your creative process or what does it take away? Is it a, a handicap or does it add something? Is it a positive thing? Uh, I also noticed, Maria, that you also, uh, yeah, the poem that you, you cited uh, some minutes ago, it was in English, but most of your work is in, in Dutch. Uh, maybe you can comment uh, of, or give an answer to this question. It's a, it's a very interesting question uh, to me. Um, at the moment, I'm writing a book which is actually based more or less on this question. I, mm -hmm. uh, the thing is that my uh, grandmother had a different mother tongue than my mother. Uh, my grandmother was from Poland. Um, and I, for the book, I'm trying to learn uh, Polish. So, yeah, in a sense, in a way to like uh, come in contact with my the mother's mother's line of my ancestors, which are very hard to trace because of their work. They were, yeah, they were mine workers and the mine workers were not very document, not documented very well. But the wives of the mine workers, they were really the last ones to ever be uh, end up in any um, in any any document. So I have not much to go on, but I have the language to go on. And um, so learning Polish has been a way to structure my poems. That, funnily enough, I am writing in English. And uh, I found that write, yeah, writing in Dutch was not the... It didn't, it didn't work as well as writing in English. And I think it has to do with an idea that the English might be the middle ground between me and my grandmother. Mm. Uh, it, it feels more fair than to uh, write in Dutch and yeah it creates enough uh, uh, questions and, and, and lines and, and, and poems so but yeah my Dutch editor is not uh, does not want to publish it <laughs> so, so I think this will end up in maybe in an exhibition or I, I'm, I'm not sure yet but it's I find it extremely rich to um, uh, to learn a new language that is not my mother tongue and and write between these languages so it's it, it's a way of yeah using using the slippage of languages as mm. a yeah yeah i can imagine uh ella uh, I, I was not sure when you were writing was it also in your own language or i'm sure that mother lee was using not her mother language because she was making up things. <laughs> uh, but how was it uh, with you, Ella? Was it in your mother tongue? Yeah, I'm writing in my mother tongue language. Yeah. In um, but I think I have, it's, it's a bit different, but I, I use a lot of Jewish texts in my work. Um, I love the stories and I love the, the so it's, it's, it's the same language, but it's different language. It's a different uh, meanings, different words, words that we're not using in the daily life. Mm -hmm. um, and I love taking words from this word, from the Jewish, from the religious world, and do maybe to change them or to, 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 to like look at them in a different way. And the name of my project is just like a small example, but the name is like, the place will soul, so the place in the Jewish world is the name of God. So when I work 
on spaces and they try to, to understand what a place is. So it's, for me, it was also what God is or maybe where is God in our life or maybe to put a place to God in my world. So it was, and I know that a lot of people that come into the exposition, they don't understand because you need to speak Hebrew and to be from the religious background to understand the whole story around. But for me, it's like, it's interesting to take stuff that I know that they have double meaning and work with that. So, yeah. yeah so it's, it's different. It's not, it's the same language, but it's, it's mm. a bit different as well. Yeah. For, for me, uh, if, oh, you first want to go, Maria? For me, that was really, um, to Ella, um, interesting. Um, I mean, I can't understand your language or read it, but when I see it, when I see it written on paper, um, I, I just look at it visually and I look at the fonts. And for me, it, it looks really fragile and delicate. And that kind of looks like your practical work. So I'm wondering if there's a connection to that. I mean, that's, that's something that I notice. Um, the curl curlies and um i don't know if it i think that kind of bonds your work together and for me just not knowing the actual language yeah purely on the visual basis purely on the, the visual basis between yeah. the two yeah. yeah i never thought about it because to me it's so nature that how the language look like like the world so it's very interesting yeah, I think it's uh, because indeed we do not know how to read uh, your language. So I think that this is a connotation that you can only notice when, when you do not speak that language. So I think this is a, an, an advantage. Uh, yeah, Maria, you also wanted to comment upon this or? Well, it, it's a bit uh, going back to the, the, the first thing you asked about me writing in English, which is, which is not my mother tongue. Mm -hmm. um, I, I doubted this for quite a while until I came across a, a project by Nicoline van Harskamp, um, who maybe also could be interesting for your um, your glass virus uh, explorations. Yeah, yeah. She has, um, she has a project called Englishes, and through the studying of the different versions of English that people actually speak in the world, she uh, makes visible that that this strange idea that we should all speak BBC or the Queen's English is actually a very um, authoritarian and, and maybe very uh, uh, not, not usable idea anymore or not, doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, mm. And in fact, it's very interesting to see what kind of Englishes exist and to take them serious and also to claim it's a, it's a bit a way to, for people also to um, give them uh, some trust in, in, in using their own English and claiming it for whatever weirdness it, <laughs> it expresses. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. Uh, well, uh, I think we have to uh, round, round up here. Uh, are there still... Uh, I see here another question. Yeah, maybe this is the last one because we have to end up a bit. Uh, but we have a, a question from Katrin. Have you ever translated your poems or writings? And I guess that's also pointed to you, Maria. Did you ever try to translate them? I have tried. And what happens? They turn into something completely different. Ah, yeah, yeah. Because the language uh, through, through sound and rhythm leads me elsewhere. And I cannot do it. And I am also never happy when I see someone else who has translated them. But what does make me happy if I see different versions and then I can live with it and thinking, yeah. well, the actual poem is somewhere in between. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I uh, really want to thank you. It was really nice uh, to meet up with you. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I think that it was a very interesting session. Uh, I should also mention uh, that, the, yeah, that there is a next session, uh, the fourth one, and that will be on the 27th of January. And uh, the topic is performance and material materiality. I uh, difficult is in uh, pronouncing it. So I really want to thank uh, the four of you, uh, the three of you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And well, I hope to see you uh, next time. Uh, I would also like to thank the audience uh, for, uh, for joining in and hope to see you next time. So see you later all. Bye. Thanks.